Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to each and every one of you. Welcome to all of our guests and to all of our regular attenders, to all those who are listening in online. Welcome. Before I forget, happy Thanksgiving to each and every one of you. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we are so grateful and we are so thankful for your person, for your infinite love, your surpassing beauty, your perfect wisdom, your most excellent holiness, your majesty, your just and true judgments and your mercy for your provision, for your kindness, Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you so very much for your Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, we thank you so very much for your life and your teachings, for your death on the cross to make atonement for our sin, for the resurrection. Jesus, we thank you that you are seated at the right hand of God. Father, in Jesus, thank you. And Father, in Jesus, thank you so very much for your precious Holy Spirit, whom we have given to us to dwell in us as a down payment of our salvation and as the seal upon us. Holy Spirit, thank you. Father, we just offer this time up to you now that you may do with it as you will and as you want, working among us and in each and every one of us according to your good and pleasing will and according to your purposes. Father God, may we learn from you what you have for us today, whether it's a word of knowledge, whether it's a word of challenge, whether it's a word of rebuke, a word of encouragement, of comfort, counsel, of testing, whatever you may have, Father. Pray that you would give it to us this day. In your name do we pray. Amen. Danger is all around us. If anything has brought that out, I think this, this COVID-19 season that we have been in has most certainly brought it out. There are some people, and I might even gently expand that to many people, who are fearful of this invisible danger COVID-19. And that has elevated perhaps our anxieties, but for the discerning eye, what we begin to find is that danger is all around us at all times. There's a chance of crashing in the car. There's a chance of sickness. There's a chance of health failing suddenly. There's a chance of lightning striking, all sorts of disasters and catastrophes and dangers surround us. And in this Psalm, Psalm 91, we find a vivid proclamation of protection that the Lord has for us in the midst of all those very dangers. And our response then to this psalm and to the dangers around us is one of continued trust in God, praising him with thanksgiving. Continued trust in God, praising him with thanksgiving for that protection. Let's dive into our text for today. Psalm 91, I encourage you to open your Bibles and follow along. There are two major themes of Psalm 91. And the first major theme that we find is the Lord is our refuge. The Lord is the one who will protect. Verses 1 and 2 say, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And the first question that may come to us is, well, how can God protect me? 
What's, what's his qualifications, so to speak, for his, protect, for, for his protection over me? And we get the answer in verse 1. Number 1, the first thing is God's station. He is the most high. He is the God of gods. He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. He is the highest you can go up on the totem pole of authority. And the second is this, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. God is the Almighty. Not just an Almighty, not just a Mighty One, but He is the definite article, the Almighty. He has all power, infinite strength, infinite ability to get anything that He wants Done. And number three, we find in verse four, and it's this, his faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. The third reason God is qualified to protect us is because of his character. He is 100% trustworthy in every regard and aspect of life. Dallas Willard once put it this way. He would say this, this world is a perfectly safe place to be. How does that strike you? Now, just two minutes ago, I listed off all of these various dangers, and maybe some people were starting to feel their anxiety rise over that. And into the midst of that, because of God's station, because of God's ability and power, and because of his character, suddenly this alternative story enters in, and we say, this world is a perfectly safe place to be. Why? Not because of our situations, but because of God Almighty. Second question we may begin to ask of this text is, all right, I'm beginning, I'm beginning to want this. I want God as my protection. I want to enter in. How do I enter into it? Verse 2 answers for us. Psalm 91, verse 2, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The first thing in order to enter into this relationship with God where he is protecting us is the declaration of trust. The second thing is the continual reliance upon God for each and every day of our lives. The third thing is a continued growing relationship with him. It can't be just a declaration, but it must be also something that continues to grow our relationship with him. The third thing is that we begin to obey his commands. And we obey his commands found in his word. In all of that, there's this trust relationship going on where we are entering into the protection of the Most High. Now I'm going to foreshadow something for us. We, we do this imperfectly, don't we? We trust the Lord imperfectly now. Which also actually makes this a messianic psalm. Because there's only one person who has trusted God absolutely perfectly, and that's Jesus Christ. And what you'll actually see a little later on, and if you caught it, we'll, we'll get there. But this is part of a psalm where Satan tempts Jesus with. That's number one. This is, this is not just a, a psalm for everyone, although it is, but it's also this psalm about the nature of the Messiah and the Messiah's work. The second truth is that even the one who trusted perfectly was still crucified. How can that be? With this sort of protection being offered, we'll get there. Now, I do want to simply say that as we are taking refuge in the Lord, and as we undergo the protection of God, it does not mean throw common sense out the door. It means we trust in God and not our security measures, which means this. Folks, I hope you put your seatbelt on on your way home. 
That's wisdom. But we don't trust our seatbelts that we might get home safely. Why? Well, people still die with their seatbelts on. We lock our doors at night. And that is a good safety measure. We don't trust the locked doors. Why? People still break in, even though there are locked doors. Okay? Use wisdom, and we don't trust in those measures. We trust in God above. Now, if there is something to protect us from, then we have to also begin to describe what in this psalm actually shares with us, or what in this psalm describes the evils that are out to get us. Let's head into verse 3. For he, God, will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. The snare of the fowler. What in the world does that mean? It means don't walk in the woods, right? <laughs> No, no, the snare of the fowler is something completely different. In that um, picture image that the psalmist is giving us, he's comparing us to birds. And there is a hunter looking to capture and kill us. There is a fowler. So what is the snare then of the enemy that is looking to capture and kill us? Well, here are some common snares that we might think about. The first is sin. The second is temptations to abandon the Lord. The temptation to abandon Scripture. The temptation to walk away from the church. The temptation to abandon ourselves to a sin. So not just sin as a regular temptation, but also to abandon ourselves to one, saying, I'm going all in on this sin. Here's some for us. The snare of apathy. Well, things are good. I'm just going to let it ride. The sin, or I'm sorry, the temptation, the snare of looking to please and entertain oneself as the ultimate end of our being. Well, I just want to do what makes me happy. The danger, here's one, the danger of getting comfortable with evil around us. Sometimes we can become hardened to evil that's around us. We just begin to say, all right, well, that's just the way things are. That's a snare of the fowler. That's a first step of being captured and taken and twisted until we are utterly destroyed. And the second thing then, so you have the snare of the fowler. The second thing is the deadly pestilence, right? That's raging, rampaging disease. And what's the promise? Verse 4, he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. It's almost like, all right, so uh, the pestilence is coming, the snare of the fowler is coming, and this is so dangerous, the psalmist must interject once again the, the features of God to hold on to from verses 1 and 2. He goes back and says, no, look, God's faithfulness will keep you. Well, in what way? We have a little bit of a pestilence going on, don't we? Christians still die from this pestilence. So in what way is this then true? In what way is it true that the one who perfectly trusts God still dies on the cross? It's in this. 
There is nothing in this world that can ultimately harm your everlasting soul if you are in Jesus Christ. Though the flesh may fail, the flesh may die, God protects and preserves you from all harm. And just as Jesus was, resurrection is coming. That is the promise of the refuge. Resurrection is coming. Verse 5, you will not fear. Notice here it's the direct reference. It's actually in the singular here, I believe. But there's a direct reference to whom the psalmist is speaking to. You will not fear. Well, what if we are afraid? That means the refuge of the Lord has not been entered into in its fullest. That's what that means. Therefore, what do we do if we're afraid? Enter into the refuge of the Lord. We'll talk about the how a little later. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Four different things. What are they? Well, here's where the psalm gets a little interesting. There's actually two different ways that this can be interpreted. The physical and the spiritual. So let's talk about the physical first, and then we'll enter into the spiritual way that this is interpreted. The physical, it means just what it means. The fear, the terror of the night. Somebody ever woken up in a cold sweat, afraid for no reason? Just me. All right, it happens to some people. Okay? You wake up and you're just afraid in the terror of the night. Here are some other terrors in the night. Somebody suddenly passing away in the midst of the night. That's a terror of the night. Okay, all those sorts of things, terrors of the night when we're considering the physical perspective. Second, the arrow that flies by day. Might as well just say it, bullets flying around. Third, pestilence that's raging disease and destruction. When we're looking at this physically, there's not much to explain. The text is what it is, and it says what it says, and it means what it means. However, there are some really fascinating things that go on here. In, our, um, in the archaeological studies done, they came across a set of ancient documents. And the first document was an ancient Jewish exorcism incantation. It was an ancient prayer of how to cast a demon out of another person. Cool. They flipped that one. Oh, look, they find another one. It's different, but it's the same sort of genre. All right, cool, we flipped that one. Then they get to the middle. And guess what's laying there in the middle? Psalm 91. And then they flip it. And guess what they find out elsewhere? Other exorcism prayers. And that makes them raise their eyebrows and go, all right, why in the world would Psalm 91 be found in the midst of exorcism rituals to get demons out of people? So they go back and they carefully examine the Hebrew. And when these Hebrew words, when the nouns are all there together, with their companion verbs, what we find is actually all of these are ancient Canaanite pagan deities. The first, terror of the night, is a type of demon. It's known for the suddenness of its attacks in the middle of the night and especially preys on young children. That's according to Malul of the Dictionary of Deities and Demons. The second, the arrow that flies by day. Um, when it's all together like that, what they're indicating or what they're referencing is a West Semitic god named Reshef, who was an archer who shot fevers and plagues, according to Gazella in Dictionary of Deities and Demons. Third, pestilence that stalks in the darkness. According to Del Olma Lita, 
writes that this word pestilence in this verse is a personified as a demon or evil deity, especially when it's in the conjunction with the evil nocturnal demon translated destruction. The next one. And finally, there's destruction that wastes at noonday, another type of demon. Wyatt says this, he says, um, it's, a, it's, it's writing about an aspect of, of death. And then he summarizes all four of these for us and he says, these are more than just physical threats, more than just literary figures, but are written of as living spiritual beings who are highly dangerous in the minds of the ancients. These four, you have the physical, you also have the spiritual. They're talking about demonic pagan deities that the Lord protects you from. Now, that may sound weird, right? We might be raising our eyebrows and like, yeah, yeah, who cares? Wait a second about this. Think about the Gospels. What's one of Jesus' major ministries in the Gospels? He goes around and he casts out demons out of people. And, you know, there are some people who look at that and they go, well, that ain't in the Old Testament. Have you ever thought that? Well, that's weird. Why is Jesus doing that? King David, I mean, does it maybe with a loot on Saul, but other than that, there's not much talk about demons, is there? But then enters in Psalm 91, and we find this connection with this is exactly what the Messiah, Jesus, also does. And we see it vividly as part of what God's role is is to do. What else does God protect us from? So we've got the physical. We've got the spiritual that he's protecting us from. Take a look in verse 7 and 8, and he continues on. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. The wicked there should just be taken in its very general form. It means everyone who is ungodly. And in context, right, if we're, especially if we're reading the previous four verses, not as spiritual but as physical, our minds might race to warfare. Right? Oh, well, this is, this is the midst of a battle, right? And somehow the psalmist is protected by God where everyone else is dying around him. Not quite. Remember the spiritual application of the last four verses. So it is not a matter of war. What this is talking about is judgment. What this is, is the judgment of God upon all the ungodly. And who is saved by God? The one who trusts in him. That's a picture of what it looks like to have faith in Jesus Christ to take him as our Lord and Savior, to be forgiven and washed clean of our sins so that we are no longer ungodly. And when we come to judgment, you know what we're going to be seeing? Millions of people falling. Why? Because they don't have Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know who will stand in grace? The ones who have Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And we watch the, and it's nothing about us, is it? It's only about what God has done to protect us. It's only about what God has done to save us. When we come to judgment, we are protected by God. What else are we protected from? There's one more thing that we're protected from. from. Jump down to verse 13. This is not just a protection, but it's actually a, um, a proclamation of bravery of the faithful one and what the faithful one will do. Verse 13, you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Now again, there's two ways to interpret that. You have the physical and you have the spiritual. Physically, it actually doesn't just mean lions and serpents. What it means is all 
hidden surprise attacks. Both lions and serpents usually attack from hidden places where they're covered up. Lion, have you ever watched like the documentaries and what lions do? You see them creeping through the grass, right, real slow. And then all of a sudden they're up and boom, 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 going after the antelope or whatever they're after. Anybody with me? All right, well, we've seen that. All right. As, take a think about a snake. Does a snake really chase its prey that often? No. What does it do? It just lies and waits in the hiding place, unless it's sunning itself, right? It just lies and waits. And then what just happens? It's the bunny comes by, whoosh, right? Right out of its hiding place. Okay, that's the idea represented here if we're taking this passage physically. But remember, we already have these, these connections to the spiritual realm before in verses um, 5 and 6. Think about this with your spiritual lens. Who's described as a serpent? Satan, Genesis chapter 3. Who's described as a lion? Satan. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. And I'll simply read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 for us here. It says this. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in the faith. It's physical. Actually, more important is the spiritual protection that God is giving us. So what else do we see? Well, let's take a look here, and we're going to begin to wrap up our time together with, with some applications from the other verses. But take a look at me very, with me very quickly at verses 11 and 12. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. We who do this imperfectly experience the protection of God, and we do experience it every day. But it's not perfect. The one who walks perfectly is Jesus Christ. And he experiences God's protection every day until what? Until the cross. Notice that it's this passage within this context of spiritual warfare between God and all these other deities and Satans that Jesus, uh, that Satan quotes this passage to Jesus to try to figure out who Jesus is and what God's plan is. He quotes verses 11 and 12, and you can find that in Matthew chapter 4. Which is why, again, I just want to draw out this distinction. It, God's protection is imperfectly upon us, right, until we, we need to submit to God's will and whatever he may have for us there. And it's perfect upon Jesus through the cross. So how do we enter into God's protection? How do we take courage? Look back with me at verses 9 and 10. It says this, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. When we make the Lord our refuge, nothing evil can harm us. And again, we've talked about that, right? We've mentioned this world is a perfectly safe place to be. Though I, I walk out of the sanctuary and get run over and hit by a car, this world is a perfectly safe place to be. Why? Because God will preserve everything that matters about me for eternity. Okay? No evil shall befall you. Now, hold on, just bear with me and read that again in the text and think about it and then put it in the context of what we experience. The text says, no evil shall befall you. 
which means this, everything that does happen for us is for our good. Romans 8, chapter 28. For all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. No evil shall befall you. Now, I know that may be hard words for us to hear as we know good Christians who have died, as we've seen what we think is evil befall people who are Christians. And we look at this psalm, and here's the question that has to come to mind. Is my thoughts about my experience true, or is the scriptures what's true? And it must be that the scriptures are true. So then we must uh, interpret Scripture accordingly so that our experience comes under Scripture and is, falls within the boundaries and folds of what Scripture says. Which is why I keep making this distinction between imperfect and perfect. And things can befall us, but they're good, just as the cross fell upon or fall, fell to Jesus. And that was good for the sake of the world. How do we enter in to his refuge? Let's look at verse 14. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. First part, because he holds fast to me in love. This becomes our practical application as step number one to enter into the refuge of God Almighty is the continual clinging to Jesus Christ for all things. That loyalty can never waver. Regardless of what else is going on, regardless of any persecution, regardless of anything that comes against you, regardless of anything that happens, we hold fast to Jesus. This is loyalty within covenant. This is faithfulness. This is trusting in God for all things. We cling to him. If we want him as our refuge, that's step number one. Have faith in Jesus in a persevering way. Step number two it says, because he knows my name. What's implied there is intimacy of relationship. Intimacy of relationship between us and God. Well, how do we have an intimate relationship with him? Number one, worship. Right? Worshiping God collectively, worshiping God as individuals. Number two, of course, a life of prayer. Folks, if, if you haven't started praying every day, pray at least five minutes a day. If you're at five minutes, do 15. If you're at 15, do 30. If you're retired, do three hours. No, wait, hold on. Yes, I'm actually serious, but not really. Smile. But seriously, just keep expanding it, right? Be, be in the Word. Read the Word, but don't just read it. Slow down and study the Word. Capture what the passage means and understand it and apply it to your life. All of those things done with God are part of what it means to have relationship with Him. Three. An important part of our relationship with him in this season is thanksgiving. I love the call to worship this morning, the idea of thanks living, right? That idea of a life of thankfulness and gratitude. For what? Folks, every moment of the day, danger is around you, spiritual or physical. And whenever it does not touch you, that's the Lord's protection. Now, I'm not trying to make you anxious or paranoid, right? We, we need, to, need to step beyond that. But before we move beyond, we need to come into this place of understanding the, the, the tenuousness of our own situation. And that it is actually God's proactive, protective care keeping you. 
not the seatbelt in the car, not the vaccine, not the locked doors, however helpful all of those things may be, who's protecting you? The Lord. That's who has you. So relationship with God is key for dwelling in the shadow of the Most High. The challenge for us today is this. Will you enter into his protection ever more fully and walk in his way ever more courageously? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your grace and your love. We thank you so very much for your continued protection. Father God, we have experienced so much protection over the course of our lives and even over the course of this church. Lord Jesus, we do pray that you would continue to protect us, continue to save us, continue to deliver us. Lord Jesus, may our faith be courageous, even when things hit us that seem like evil. Holy Spirit, come. In your name do we pray. Amen.